The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, so last time we uh, started talking about more complicated mixtures. Uh, to get into colligator properties. And uh, the example we gave was a binary system that has uh, two components and two phases. So we have a liquid phase on the bottom, a gas phase on top, and two components, A and B with composition, compositions Xa and Xb in the liquid phase. Those are the mole fractions, and uh, Ya and Yb in the gas phase, the mole fractions in the gas phase. And we, the, what we did last time was to begin to say how many um, degrees of freedom do we have? How many variables do we need to completely describe this mixture? And it turned out that for this mixture, we only needed two, two variables, two degrees of freedom. We start out with four variables, the temperature, the pressure, and uh, the uh, components in the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, composition in the liquid phase and the composition in the gas phase. We need one of these, either Xa or Xb, and one of these, either Yb or Yb, because they add up to one. So you start with four, but because you're in a mixture, because, and at equilibrium, you have constraints. You have the, the uh, uh, um, chemical, uh, chemical potentials that have to be equal to each other. The chemical potential of A in the gas phase has to be equal to the chemical potential of A in the liquid phase, and the chemical potential of B in the gas phase has to be equal to the chemical potential of B in the liquid phase. So you, have, you start with four variables, temperature, pressure, Xa, Ya, then you have the constraints that mu A in the liquid phase has to be equal to mu A in the gas phase because you're at equilibrium, and mu B in the liquid phase has to be equal to mu B in the gas phase. So four minus two constraints means you have two degrees of freedom. And so if you want to know everything about this Mixture, all you need is the temperature and the total pressure, and that's enough. It's kind of amazing. You know, give me the temperature and pressure and these two, two uh, components, like water and alcohol, for instance, and I can tell you everything about the compositions. It's very powerful. And then we said that this turned out to be a special case or, or a subcase of the uh, more general Gibbs phase rule where the Gibbs phase rule tells you that if you have um, C components, in this case here we have two, in the general case of, of C components with P phases, the number of degrees of freedom is C minus P plus two. It's components and phases. And what we're going to start today is by proving this, and then we'll uh, do, more, uh, do more with this problem here. Okay, so the first thing is for us to prove Gibbs phase rule. All right, so Gibbs phase rule. We start out with all the variables that we have, and then we add the constraints. And for the Gibbs phase rule, then we start with the two knobs that we can turn externally, which are the temperature and pressure. So we start with temperature and pressure as two variables that we have. And then we have a bunch of phases. We have C phases. And in each phase, we have to describe the composition in that phase. Right? So uh, for each phase alpha, we have to describe its mole fraction. So here we needed to describe Xa for phase A and Ya for phase A. For, for the liquid, for component A in the, in the gas phase. So now we have alpha components. 
And for each uh, component, we have to describe its mole fraction in that particular phase. So we have to describe x sub x sub i. But we have a constraint on that. The constraint is that the sum of all the mole fractions has to be equal to 1. So that's what it is to be a mole fraction. So the constraint is that x sub i, i equals 1 to alpha, is equal to 1. Okay. So the uh, constraint on the number of uh, uh, the components, uh, instead of having, uh, actually, i goes from 1 to, to, to c, because that's the number of components. So instead of having uh, C different compositions that we need to take care of, we only need C minus 1. Just like here, we only needed 1, just xA. We didn't need both xA and xB because we knew the sum was equal to 1. So that means that we really need C minus 1 variables to describe the composition in one of the phases. But we have, we have P phases. So let me fix this. We, have, we had C components. We have P phases. And so for each phase, we have to describe the composition. So that means that we need P times C minus 1 variables to describe all the components in all the phases, okay. plus these extra two. So the total number of variables, then, that we start out with before putting the fact that we're in equilibrium is going to be 2 plus P times C minus 1. So that basically, that's a basic description of the system. And then we put in the same constraints that we had up here in terms of the uh, uh, chemical potentials. If I take any of the components, let's take the alpha component or the i component, because it's in equilibrium, the chemical potential of that particular component has to be the same in all the phases. Right? So let's take the i component. So yi in phase 1 has to be equal to yi in phase 2 has to be equal to yi in phase 3 has to be equal to yi in phase p. Right? All the chemical potentials have to be the same across all the phases for that component. And if you count the number of equations, the number of equal signs here, that's p minus 1. If p minus 1 equal signs constraints due to the fact that I have an equilibrium here. So this gives me p minus 1 constraints. And this is true for every single component. Every single component has to have its chemical potential, its chemical potential equal throughout the phases. So p minus 1 is constrained for one component times c components. So a total of c times p minus 1 total constraints. My variables, my constraints, so the number of degrees of freedom then becomes p times c minus 1 Uh, minus C times P minus 1, and then plus 2. Right? And if you multiply this out, the P times C gets rid of the P times C here, then you get the uh, plus C minus P plus 2, which is the Gibbs phase rule, right? Which I'm going to bring back up here, C minus P plus 2. So just purely in accounting uh, and it, just accounting for the variables and the constraints. Okay, any questions on how we did this? It's great. Okay, so uh, let's move on then to these ideal solutions, which is this case right here. And the first, first thing we're going to do is uh, look at the case where um, we have A is a, is a solvent and it's volatile and B is a solute which is non-volatile. So let's take the first case which is to have A volatile, let's say the solvent, 
could be water, and B is going to be the solute. It's non volatile. Okay, let's interchange solute and non volatile to be consistent here. But so this could be sugar. Should be a, a sweet uh, water. All right. Okay. So uh, Mr. Raoul looked at such solutions where, um, and found that uh, they could be well described by the following uh, diagram here. So if I plot on the x-axis here, from 0 to 1, I'm going to plot the partial molar fraction of the solute. Partial molar fraction of the solute, that's going to be Xb. So when Xb equals to 0, I have a pure water solution. When Xb is equal to 1, I have pure sugar. And then on the y-axis, I'm going to plot the total pressure. So when I have a pure water solution, the total pressure is going to be the same as the vapor pressure of water at a particular temperature. Let's take temperature fixed at some value. Okay. Temperature is fixed at some value. I'm going to have the total pressure is going to be the partial pressure of the water. And clearly, when I don't have any water left, all I have is the sugar, there's no pressure. We're going to assume that it's totally non-volatile. Obviously, there's going to be a little bit of vapor pressure. Even at room temperature, 10 to the minus, I don't know, 13 tors or something like this. You know. But anyway, it's basically zero here. And what Raoul said is that, well, these two points are just connected by a straight line. Simplest way to connect two points. Okay. Basically, he said that the pressure uh, of the, uh, the vapor pressure of the water, in this case, is equal to Xa times Pa star. Okay. I could also plot this with Xa going from 1 to 0, since Xa plus Xb is equal to 1. Or I could write this as 1 minus Xb times Pa star where A star, the star means pure water, or pure A. And PA is the vapor pressure of the mixture, which in this case here is the total pressure, because I don't have anything else that's volatile. And this is Raoul's law. And the first thing that uh, you can use this for is, is, is to look at your first colligator property, which is vapor pressure lowering. And let me, let me point another thing first. So if a solution obeys that property here, it's called an ideal solution. So if the water sugar solution really did behave like a straight line like this as you increase the amount of sugar, then it would be an ideal solution. Many things are very close to it. It's not, not such a bad um, approximation, especially in that region up here, around zero, when the amount of sugar is pretty small. You expect it to, to obey an ideal solution behavior. All right, so let's, let's look now at, uh, at a glass of water that has sugar in it. I've got my glass of water, H2O, with some sugar dissolved in it, and it's got a certain vapor pressure on top, Pa or pH2O. And I'm going to ask the question, what's the difference between uh, the vapor pressure and the, uh, what it would be without the sugar in it? What is Pa star minus Pa? 
obeys Raoul's law, P A star, P A is X A, P A star, plug that in here, that's one minus X A, P A star, one minus X A is X B, X B, P A star. Well, the first thing I know is that this is a positive number. X B is a positive number, P A star is a positive number, this is greater than zero. That means that the act of putting some solute in my water decreases the vapor pressure of the water in the, in the gas phase. Pretty simple. It's called vapor pressure lowering. And we can actually um, take this one step further. We can draw a phase diagram. So our, our usual phase diagram here with temperature on this axis here and pressure on this axis here. And we've got our uh, triple point sitting here and our gas liquid line with a critical point here. So this is the gas here, there's a liquid here. And we've got our, this is gonna be uh, water, so it's got a negative slope. I think I got it right this time. And there's the solid phase here. Okay, this is for the pure stuff. So now I can draw a similar diagram for sugared water. And I just looked at this, assuming it uh, obeys Raoul's law. What we looked at here was the gas-liquid coexistence. Right? And we found that the gas -liquid, at the gas-liquid coexistence point the vapor pressure of the water was less than if it were pure. So that means that if I look at the gas-liquid coexistence, which is this line right here, in the presence of sugar, that whole line is going to get lowered. Right? The pressure, the vapor pressure of the water is going to be lower when the, when the sugar is there. So the whole thing is going to get lower. Now, if I have a solid, if the water is a solid, it's going to crystallize as water. The sugar is going to be separated from the water. Uh, the sugar and the water are not going to really know about each other. You're just going to have big chunks of, of pure water with every now and then a, a molecule of sugar that's, that's in there. So you don't really expect to see any difference between the pure solid water in terms of the gas solid interface and the pure liquid water. There's no sugar in the gas phase. Right? And as far as the gas phase is concerned, that, that uh, solid phase is, is pure water. It's just seeing pure ice crystals on the surface. Every now and then there's a molecule of sugar. So you expect this to be pretty close here. So you expect the triple point to go down, and if I now, I go up to the solid-liquid coexistence, and go up like this, I can make a prediction about solid-liquid coexistence. I can predict that if I'm looking at, let's, let's put one bar here somewhere. One bar. Room temperature is sitting here somewhere, right? One bar room temperature, water is all liquid. One bar, all right. This is what it would be usually. Solid liquid, three, uh, uh, that would be 273 degrees Kelvin. That's the melting point of water. So now if I put sugar in the water and I follow my diagram here, what I find is that the new melting point of water is some new temperature T, P1, where T1 is less than 273 degrees Kelvin. You all know this. When you put something like an impurity, a salt, or sugar in the water, the uh, melting point gets depressed. It goes down. Straight from here. You can build it up straight from here. We, when we get um, uh, to, to the to the colligator properties, we'll, we'll attack it from the, the point of um, chemical potentials. You know, we'll equate chemical potentials and we'll look at it. 
change in the chemical potential of the water and the presence of the sugar, and we'll do it rigorously. But this is sort of the first indication that these colligative properties are all connected to each other, connected through this diagram here. OK. So when I was, uh, when I was a kid, and I, I knew that this was the case. Everybody knows this is the case, right? You put salt in your water, and you, you expect all, all, th all sorts of things to happen. You expect the vapor pressure to, to get down. And, and certainly, you know that you add salt and to the roads, and you know, the water melts, et cetera. And my mother always told me that the reason why you added salt to the water was so that the uh, temperature of the water would get higher when you, when you try to boil pasta. And for, I don't know, 15 years I believed her until I taught thermodynamics. And I actually calculated the change in the temperature by adding a few pinches of salt to the water. And you know how small that temperature changes? You should calculate it. It's really tiny. It won't make any difference for the water. Probably the, the difference in the temperature of the water would be the same as if I cooked here versus halfway up Mount Washington in New Hampshire or something like this. Probably even less. Makes no difference. The reason why you add salt is so that it tastes better. That's the only reason. It has nothing to do with thermodynamics. All right. Any questions on this? So we're going to make it a little bit more complicated now, if there's no questions. We're going to now have, uh, instead of having one non-volatile solute, we're going to have two. Uh, we're going to have this mixture where both, both components are volatile. All right. Let me erase this. Actually, let me not erase this. I want to keep Raul's law here. Where's this one? OK, we're going to have a mixture of two volatile components. For instance, water and alcohol. Your sort of your typical martini type situation. Or margarita, what's, whatever is your favorite drink. OK. So now we have XA, we have XB, we have YA, we have YB. And we're going to uh, assume that, uh, that both, uh, both obey Raoult's law with respect to each other. So now if, if I draw a diagram and I just focus on, so there's the total pressure sitting here. Um, or the, and I just focus on one component and ignore the other. Suppose I, I focus on A. And I know that A in the presence of B, the partial pressure of A is going to uh, obey Raoult's law. And let's take A to be the more volatile component in this case here. Okay. So P A star is bigger than P B star. The partial pressure of pure A at a particular temperature, T fixed, is bigger than PB star. It's the more volatile of the two. So if I were to plot uh, PA as a function of XB going from 0 to 1, I'm going to obey Raoult's law. I'm going to start at PA star. And I'm going to go down linearly to XB equals 1. Now I can do the same thing for the partial pressure of B and assume that in the presence of A, just looking at this component B now, and I'm looking at the partial pressure of B, and this guy that's impurity in it, A, B obeys Raoult's law with A in there. Uh, but now I gotta f if I want to keep the same x-axis here, um, I can look at XA here going from 0 to 1. So I just basically flip the, the thing over. So I, at xA equals 0, that's pure B. PB star is less than PA star. I'm starting here on that side here, PB star. And I'm going down in a straight line to 0. PB is equal to XB 
be d star straight line all the way to 0 when xb is equal to 0. So that's pb. And that's pa. Now the total pressure is the sum of the two, pa plus pb. So the total pressure in this system here that I measure up here is just the sum of these two straight lines. Let me do it in blue. The total pressure, if you add up these two straight lines together, you get another straight line. Two straight lines makes a straight line. P is PA plus PB is equal to XA PA star plus XB PB star, right? Now XA and XB are related. XB is one minus XA. Uh, and so really this is only a function of one variable here, linearly with respect to one variable. Okay, what does this diagram tell me? So now let's ignore how we built it. And let's take a look at it. So I have, I'm gonna take XB on the bottom here from zero to one. Could choose either one. And I've got the straight line for the total pressure going from P A star to P B star. T is fixed. Okay, I need to tell you that T is fixed because I have two degrees of freedom, right? I have two degrees of freedom, and my degrees of freedom are the temperature, which I'm fixing, and the composition in the liquid phase, which I'm fixing. So my two variables are XB and T. Those are my two degrees of freedom. And I'm telling you what the total pressure is. I'm giving you total pressure as a function of x, b, and t. Okay? By fixing t, I'm really telling you what the pressure is as a function of x, b. So the Gibbs phase rule then tells me that the pressure should be only a function of x, b if t is fixed. It should be a line, not necessarily straight, but it should be a line in this diagram to have coexistence. So what this line is then, this line is the line of points that tells me when, I'm allowed, when I have coexistence between the gas phase and the liquid phase. This is the coexistence <laughs> line. This is the gas liquid coexistence line for the mixture. Okay? It's not so different than this coexistence line up here. Right? So you can think of this as a phase diagram kind of like you thought you know this as a phase diagram. It's got a coexistence line. And then if I'm above this line, if I'm at a certain pressure here, if I'm at this point here, this pressure, well, let's go to a slightly higher different pressure. Let's go to this pressure here and this composition here. I'm not on the line. That means that I don't have coexistence between liquid and gas. I'm above the line. I'm at a pressure higher than where I would get coexistence. The pressure is higher, means I probably don't have a gas anymore. Right? Probably means that the total pressure pushing down on my mixture is too high to have a gas phase around. It means that the top part here is the liquid phase. So I'm in the liquid phase if I, above this line, and I have a coexistence between the gas and the liquid if I'm on the line. Now, if I'm below this line here, well, I get in trouble. I get in trouble because my first instinct would be, well, this is just gas. You know, I go from liquid, then I have coexistence, then I go into the gas phase, but my x-axis here is the composition in the liquid phase. There's no liquid around. So I really can't say anything here. This diagram is a little bit meaningless down here because my x-axis is describing a phase which doesn't exist on the diagram. <coughs> right? On this diagram here, at least. So when you see it, this diagram here with Raoul's law on it, you've got to remember that you know, the part that's really interesting is above the, the, the line and at the line itself. 
So you could do an experiment then on this, on this, uh, this line here. Let's get rid of this here. This next. All right. T fixed. This is the liquid phase. So suppose I start with some high pressure up here somewhere, this point, let's call this point one here. We've got my container, my piston here, P is equal to P1. And again, I put the point in an awkward place. Let's put it right here. P1 and composition XB. P1 and XP here. And I'm going to slowly decrease the pressure. I start in this composition. The composition doesn't change. I'm just decreasing the pressure. Decrease the pressure, decrease the pressure, decrease the pressure. And at some point, I get to that line. I get to that line. And what happens when I get to that line? I start to see bubbles coming out of the liquid. And vapor starts to form because it wants to be in the coexistence line. So I get to that line, and I get a little bit of bubbles forming and a little bit of vapor. There's a liquid here, a little bit of gas. And that's why this line here is called a bubble line. So I've gone down, decreased the pressure. So P has gone down now. Decrease the pressure. And if I keep on decreasing the pressure, well, I'm not going to jump into this area of the diagram because this area of the diagram means there's no liquid. And it's a meaningless area. If I keep decreasing the pressure, I'm still going to be in coexistence. I'm just going to make more gas, more vapor. I'm going to, go, I'm going to transfer more of the liquid into the vapor phase. I'm going to ride down that line. I'm going to ride down the line. I'm decreasing the pressure. I'm not going to skip into here. I'm going to ride down the line here. Okay, I'm going to keep the, decreasing the pressure even more. P goes down even more. Now I make even more vapor. There's my piston right here. There's the gas phase. There's the liquid phase. And I've transferred material from the liquid phase to the gas phase. But I've also changed the composition of my liquid phase. Right? If I read my new composition, this is what I started out with, Xb. My new composition in the liquid phase is going to be, let's call it Xb prime. There's going to be more solute in there, or more, X, more B in there, than what, it, what I started out with. Now, which one was the more volatile one, A or B? A was more volatile, right? So as I decrease the pressure and I start bubbling off the material, which one's going to bubble off preferentially? A is going to. So uh, it makes sense that I would concentrate B in there. Okay. Decrease, decrease the pressure. Bubbles that are rich in A come out. Both A and B come out, but more A comes out than B. And what's left over is rich in the more, in the less volatile material, which is B. So you're beginning to see how distillation comes about. This is like the first step in a, in a, in a distillation process. Right. OK. So let's make this a little bit more complicated now. Any questions first? Yeah. All right, now suppose I wanted to know, so I, I, I found out where the composition in the uh, liquid phase is here. And I know that should tell me immediately where the composition in the gas phase is here. So I have all, I have everything I need to no, to calculate what the composition in the gas phase is. So I have everything I need then to calculate and draw a diagram that looks just like this 
except where my x-axis is the y's instead of the x's. I'm going to make the same diagram, except now I'm going to use the gas phase as my reference point, the composition in the gas phase. OK, so, so I need to get, so here I got P as a function of xb. I want P, total pressure, as a function of yb. So I can draw a diagram that looks just like this, except now with the x-axis being the gas phase composition. All right, let's turn the crank. What do I know? I know Dalton's law. PA is YA times total pressure. I'm trying to, I'm trying to mix up the, uh, the partial pressures and the total pressure in all ways that I know how to write it and then hope that you know, something's going to come out that, that's going to be helpful. So that's Dalton's law. I know Raoul's law, PA is XA star times PA star, and that's Raoul. And I, I can write Raoul's law in a different way. I can write it as PB is equal to XB PB star. That's just Raoul's law for, for B, 1 minus XA PB star. And I'm looking for, I'm looking for this. I'm looking for the composition in the, in the gas phase or the total pressure as a function of the composition in the gas phase. Let's start, by, let's start by finding the composition in the gas phase as a function of the composition in the liquid phase and the total pressure. I can rewrite YA is equal to PA over P. The total pressure is PA plus PB sum of the two partial pressures, PA over PA plus PB. And I'm trying to get YA in terms of the X phase, or XBs, in terms of the composition in the liquid phase. And I know how to relate that to a uh, so constant, which is the vapor pressure of a pure material times the, uh, and, the, uh, and the composition in the liquid phase through Raoul's law. This is XA PA star divided by XA PA star plus XB B star, and I know that XB is 1 minus XA, so this is XA PA star times PB star plus PA star minus PB star times XA. Okay, where all I did was to replace XB with 1 minus XA and rearrange my equation on the bottom. So I've gotten the composition in the, liquid in the gas phase in terms of the composition in the, in, the, in the liquid phase. They're not independent. I knew they weren't independent, and this just shows me that you know, math works. OK, so I've got that, and I can, I can invert this to get the composition in the liquid phase in terms of the composition in the gas phase. It's not so straightforward, but you can get xA as a function of yA as well. But xA, if you inverse this, you get xA is equal to Ya PB star it looks kind of the same. PB star plus PA star plus PB star minus PA star times Ya. Okay. X as a function of Ya. All right. So now we can actually. Um, we can actually put everything together starting from Dalton's law because really what we want is the total pressure as a function of the composition in the gas phase. Right? So there's our total pressure here. There's the composition in the gas phase. There's PA. Uh, we found composition in the gas phase in terms of composition in the liquid phase. P is equal to YA over PA which is equal to YA over XA PA star, right? So if we could get rid of this here, in terms of YA, we'd be all set. We'd get the total pressure as a function of the composition in the liquid, in the gas phase. And there's our, there's what we need to 
we plug that in here. And now we have the total pressure in terms of constants, like these pure vapor pressures, and the composition of A in the gas phase. Right. So let me uh, find a way to write that somewhere. Let me write it right here in this little box here. If you plug it in, you get something that's not a straight line, unfortunately. It doesn't look like Raoul's law, P A star P B star, P A star plus P B star minus P A star times Y A. Okay. It's not a straight line. It's a more complicated function. What does it look like? Looks like this. I'm going to use the same sort of plot. I'm going to plot the total pressure on this axis here, on the y axis. I'm going to keep the T fixed, temperature is fixed. So I'm going to find the total pressure as a function of the composition in the gas phase. I'm going to put YB here, YB going from 0 to 1. So it's kind of looking like what I had before, right? Total pressure is going to look the same. If you want to do it in terms of B, you just have everywhere you see B, you replace it with A. And everywhere you say A, you replace it with B. You just interchange the two. The two. You know that if Y, B is equal to 0, that you have pure A. So you know that this is going to be P, A star here. You know if you have Y, B equals to 1 in the gas phase, you have pure B in the gas phase. You know that what you have is the uh, vapor pressure of the pure pure B, in this case, the pure water, PB star, okay, where A is more volatile than B. Okay. A would be the uh, ethanol, and B, B would be the water. And it's not a straight line. If it were Raoul, he would say, you know, just connect these two with a straight line. But it's not. It's not. We just figure out with the equation here, and it turns out to be a line that looks like this. Okay, it's a curved line. That looks a little bit like this. OK, what does this line mean? This line is also a coexistence line. Right? That's what we started out with. We started out with Raoul. That was part, our, a part of our derivation. Right? Raoul's law tells you the composition at coexistence. It tells you the pressure of the total pressure or pressure, partial pressure at coexistence and the composition. So this is a coexistence line between the liquid and the gas. Coexistence between liquid and gas. But now it's not as a function of the composition of the liquid phase. It's a function of the composition in the gas phase, which was missing before. So now if I do my experiment, and I'm, so what does this mean here? So if I have a point, if I have a pressure which is lower than the line here, then I have pure gas. Pressure, low pressure, I have pure gas. Don't have any liquids. And that's fine because I, can, I know what that point is. If I'm sitting below the line here somewhere, so I'm sitting here, some composition in the gas phase, a certain pressure, that's fine. It's a meaningful point. Right? So it's uh, my container here has a piston on it, and I'm starting out with. This pressure P, P1 here, P1 pressing down, and I got YB in this here, and I increase the pressure. Pressure goes up. Composition doesn't change. I'm just increasing the pressure. Increasing the pressure, increasing the pressure. And at some point, the pressure becomes big enough that I start to see liquid forming, little droplets of liquid forming in my container.
So now I have little droplets of liquid that are forming in the container that are going to start to rain down and form a little bit of liquid pooling at the bottom of the container. And that's called the dew line. This is called the, the other one was called the bubble line. This is called the dew line. Okay, so when I reach the dew line, I start forming liquid. And again, just like in the previous case, if I keep increasing the pressure, I don't go into this area here. First of all, this area is meaningless for this diagram here. Because right? this area is pure liquid. But the x-axis here doesn't tell me about the composition of pure liquid. It's all yb. It's all about the composition and the gap. Yes? Uh, what's in between the two curves? Between the dew line and the bubble line? Yes. It's this never, never world where you're not allowed to inhabit. We're going to go into that next time. Right? On how to use those two curves together. OK, but the same thing happens here. If I increase the pressure, I'm going to ride the coexistence line up. I ride it up and keep riding it up. And I get liquid forming in here. And I can find out the composition in the gas phase now. The composition in the gas phase, as I increase the pressure, I get yb prime. There's yb that I started out with, with yb prime is less than yb. Okay, remember, b was the, the less volatile of the two. As I increase the pressure, I'm forming liquid. The composition in the gas phase changes. You decrease the mole fraction of the, more, of the, of the less volatile material in the gas phase. Okay? The more volatile A becomes more prevalent in the gas phase. And what's coming down is mostly then it's enriched in B. Okay, you've done an enrichment of the less volatile material down in here. And now you can put the two together as the prescient question was, uh, was, was asked. Um, now we can have, we mix the two together. We mix our Raoul diagram with our our dew line diagram, we mix the bubble line and the dew line together in one diagram, which is going to be a powerful diagram to use. Total pressure, temperature fixed. You got two. Two materials, PA star is bigger than PB star. Okay? So I'm going to have PA star here, PB star down here. And if I choose as my x axis to have XB going from 0 to 1, I can draw a coexistence line on this axis, on this diagram. Okay, that's the coexistence li line in terms of XB. And any point up here is well described by this xb value and the p value. And as long as I have xb here, I'm not allowed to touch the bottom part of this diagram. But now if I add another x-axis, I'm going to add yb going from 0 to 1. Okay. I draw a coexistence line in terms of yb like this. So this line is P as a function of YB coexistence line. This line is total pressure function of XB. And as long as I'm on this line or below this line, then this axis makes sense. That's how we build this diagram here. It's got a bubble line on top and the dew line on the bottom. If I'm up here, going down, I'm going to hit the bubble line. If I'm down here, I go up in pressure, I'm going to hit the dew line. And next time, well, next time we have an exam, but on Friday, we'll figure out how to use this diagram.